12 o'clock, so we'll get started. Hello, everyone. My name is Don Saucy. I'm the Associate Director of the Teaching and Learning Center here at Kansas State, and you have come to the Teaching and Learning Center's Professional Development Series. We meet every Wednesday at noon. We have lots of awesome stuff, a lot of events we've archived already this semester. If you missed an event and need to see it, you can watch it. We have all those recorded for you. Last week, we had an amazing teaching chat, and next week, uh, we have an event called How Do I Engage in the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, a discussion with teaching scholars and their experiences. And that'll include people like Andy Barkley and Jason Bergtold and Kim Williams and Lisa Rubin. We talk all about how they've taken their research to examine the teaching and learning process. But that's next week. Today, we are very lucky to have our Interim Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer, Dr. B. Stoney, is going to be talking to us about teaching for change. Dr. Stoney, we're so excited for your event. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Saucier, and thank you all for being here this afternoon, as well as giving me the opportunity to uh, share some things with you about teaching for change. You know, when we talk about teaching for change, my question to you all is, you know, what does it mean to, to infuse equity, um, inclusion, diversity into your classroom settings, particularly the curriculum, and how do you as teachers, what does that mean to your students? And also, how do you provide them a sense of belonging when you're looking at your course content? I realize these questions aren't really easy to answer, uh, but they are really necessary when we're fostering uh, inclusive classroom, um, particularly when you're trying to diversify your content. And I will sh say that the information I'm sharing today, it doesn't matter to the content that you're teaching, it's, um, it's really flexible to what you teach, how you teach. So my first question, second question to you, to you is, so what does it mean to be an inclusive teacher? You know, this may include um, creating equitable education environment, uh, designing educational experiences, uh, such as pre, uh, pre-knowledge, skills, what is the demographic, demographic makeup of your classroom, uh, what kind of attitudes do the students as learner come in with, uh, how do you create, um, how do you create uh, inviting course content uh, for your environment where students feel a sense of belonging, but also, you know, how do you diversify the content? That, that can be quite challenging more often. And being aware of any mitigating and harmful effects such as biases that could experience in the classroom. So I want to go ahead and dive into the benefits of an inclusive classroom with teaching for change. My agenda, oh, wait, hold on, I got to get my, uh, all right. Uh, my agenda for today, you know, I'm going to look at defining uh, equity diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And I use this information based on our uh, 6A framework of our diversity plan. Uh, I wanna know what your understanding of DEIB, I'm gonna cut it short because it's faster for me to say it that way. Uh, what is the relevance in practice when we're talking about DEIB into your course content? And I'm gonna uh, offer a few tips uh, just for teaching for change. And then I'll try to hurry up and actually keep me on time with the clock so that I can answer questions. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. First, I want to start off with an icebreaker. And this is where I want you to put them in rooms. And I'm going to give them about, uh, let's give them about eight minutes. Okay. And I want you, when you get into your rooms, I want you to find 10 things you have in common. 10 things. And one person can take notes. I'll let you all decide that. And then when we come back after the eight minutes, I'm just going to randomly select groups because of time. But I want you, uh, you to be able to share at least five of those 10 things. And the reason why we're doing this is so that you can understand what does it mean as students to feel that the environment is um, welcoming, a sense of belonging, as I stated. Uh, how do you begin to find commonalities as students? And I'm talking to you as teachers, but right now you're my students. And then what are those things that you do have in common and how do they impact learning? 
Okay, Ashley, you can go ahead and put them in groups. Okay, I'm gonna do nine groups and that way we have about three people in each. Okay, and then in eight minutes, we'll come back, all right? Now, there we go, all right, thank you. Gosh, I'm gonna quit doing a breakout room because this, this is the part where I always mess up. All right, so I'm gonna randomly select a group, uh, group two. Uh, just kind of share with us, what did you learn about each other? I don't know who was in group two, so that's what I randomly selected. Okay, anyone? Amber, are you talking? You got the list. <laughs> I can, I was thinking, I was like, are we group two? I think we were, yes. So hi, good morning, um, afternoon. It's actually afternoon now. So we had a list that was a little more maybe like generic and like the things we have in common um, as students for the, your class, we were interested in learning, we were interested in diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging topics. Um, we found out that we were all citizens in the US and that we live in a country that is multicultural. Uh, we found out that we all like Mexican food, so after class, we go get them. Uh, we learned to ride a bike as a child, and then I have a bunch more that I could continue on if you're interested, but. Yeah, yep. me, thank you, Amber. Let me, uh, how about group nine? Hi, this is Alice. I can report for group nine. I think we're group nine. Okay. Agree, I think. Um, so we all work for K-State. We all wear purple. We've all been to the zoo. We all have siblings. We all love lasagna. We love reading. We like classic rock. We've been outside the US, been in the Kansas at least five years, and we all have more than one car. Okay. And I'll select one other group. How about group three? Thank you, Alice. Who's in group three? Yeah, so I was in group three with- oh, Thank uh, you, Noah. Yeah, absolutely. So a couple of things that we shared that we all had a connection to K-State. We all wore glasses. Uh, <laughs> we spoke English as our first language. We have taken multiple studies to work towards a degree of some sort. We've taught in some capacity. Um, and then we played a sport at one point in our lives. Okay. The reason why I want you all to um, participate in this icebreaker really is, how do you begin to get students to understand how to learn more about each other without it causing embarrassment or most of our students usually shy away when we hear the word icebreaker. Um, as faculty, I want to know how do you begin to bring students together to understand that even though we do have a lot of similarities and differences, we all still live not only in this, under the same umbrella, but the umbrella that allows us to be individuals, but also to be collective folks within a classroom when we're learning about each other. I, I just wanted you all to learn a little bit about each other as you were doing this particular icebreaker. I'm going to continue on with uh, the presentation. I really like this um, statement by uh, the Ford Foundation. And we believe diversity is a mission, critical piece of our culture, and that without equity and inclusion and belonging, it would be impossible for our diverse staff, meaning their staff, to do their best work fighting inequality in the world. And that's how I, I strongly feel we at K-State, we're doing our best to fight not only inequality, but also to prepare our students to understand social justice and how do you infuse that into your curriculum? Understand DEIB, how do you infuse that into the curriculum? But then also what the world would be like without DEIB, uh, living in a very monocultural state. So I'm gonna go through the next uh, four slides in defining DEIB, but like I said, I'm using the um, a 6A framework from our diversity uh, plan. So being a part of, uh, when, you, when you were defining these four words, you really have to pull them apart. 
And when we pull them apart, it's very vital that we do. You know, we cannot hold DEIB and uh, as separate concepts because they all interact. And how they interact is, can we even set clear goals around them when we're trying to strategize information for our students? For example, you know, diversity is often perceived uh, to be about perspective, representation, tough conversation and supporting uh, inclusion. With inclusion, it prompts answers about creating those types of environments. And it's also conducive to give feedback, supporting diversity ideas, and also being open. When we talk about equity, you know, it's often described as fairness. And I, I have found to say, me personally, I struggle with the word fairness when defining equity, equity because fair is not fair. And it looks very different for, for all of us, depending on that situation. But when we talk about equity, we do want to talk about sameness. We want to talk about how we value uh, diversity of the person or persons that we are teaching. And then also being inclusive when we're uh, talking about equity. But yet there's a redundancy and competency thoughts that are everywhere. And it's hard to first tell, you know, what definition are we basically using? And I have learned in my four, five months being in this uh, position that um, when we're trying to define DEIB, we all have various ways in how we're defining it. And I, and I strongly believe that we need to come to a point as a university that we are using the same definitions throughout, whether you're a student, faculty, or staff. So, um, Let's examine each of these words uh, collectively. So when we're talking about diversity, diversity is a representation of all our varied identities and differences. And as you know, it includes not just race, but you know, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, natural origin, tribes. Uh, sometimes we forget about that. Socioeconomic status, uh, thinking and even how we communicate. Our communication styles are very diverse, but yet we have to be able to reflect on the idea that you know all community members are welcome. We want to make sure that value, and I'm, now I'm referencing students. Okay, um, they're welcome, value, and free to be their authentic selves collectively and individually. And sometimes we forget that when how should I say when we when I'm saying collectively, I'm not actually referencing, oh, so you represent a group of, no, I'm just meaning collectively in our thoughts uh, and then as individuals. When we're talking about our next, um, the next uh, definition is really equity. And when I say equity, I want you all to understand it's important in this line of work that we not only distinguish diversity from inclusion, but we also need to understand what we mean when we say equity. You know, the process to foster equity on, on this campus, I, I strongly believe is a process to create equivalent outcomes, whether for uh, people from historically marginalized groups, uh, sexual identities, uh, by race, et cetera, all the ones I named uh, from under diversity. We have to make sure that, you know, we are creating equivalent outcomes for all these groups. Uh, we also have to know that this process is essentially an effort to undo systemic barriers, which we all have dealt with over most of you our entire lives. And, some, and for some of you, your young lives like Noah, okay? And that um, these systemic barriers uh, have been uh, truly barriers to uh, inclusion uh, from for social identity groups, particularly, um, and we have to know that uh, we experience differential treatment in society at large. So, as the uh, definition here says, seeks to ensure equivalent treatment, equality of opportunity, and fairness in access to information and resources for all. And and again, all means our students. Uh, the next one is uh, inclusion. So with inclusion, we want to make sure that we build a culture of belonging by actively inviting the contribution 
and participation of all. Not every person would want to have a voice, but you want to make sure as faculty that their voices are included. Kind of like this picture I want you to see here. When you look at this picture to my left, to my right, your left, you see, and this, this is a picture of people gathering together, so to speak, coming to make a point. And in this picture, you see to my right that you have a host of folks that want to come in together to not only be included, but to be uh, attended to as far as, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, creating balance, okay? But yet when there's an unbalance of creation, what really happens is you have to keep in mind that no one person can or should be called upon to represent an entire community because that's nearly impossible. Uh, as I shared with the student uh, yesterday, I want to know who you are. And he said, well, I'm half native and I'm half Mexican. He said, but I don't know where to fall because I feel I have to represent both groups. I said, well, you have to be able to understand who you are before you can begin to represent any groups. I said, but you also have to understand that we're not asking you to represent two different groups. We're asking you to represent who you are as a person. I said, and in, then you can share the identities of the two groups in which you belong. But that's a heavy load to really carry for our students when they're trying to represent an entire community. Because I can tell you now, every person on this <laughs> in here, you're not representing your entire community, but rather yourself. And then our last one is belonging. And with belonging, it's a sense of security of support and connectedness. Every one of our students want to feel connected in the classroom to the information that they're learning to see really, how am I valued while I'm learning about these things? I chose this particular picture because if you look rather closely to it, the words that really stood out for me was connect, uh, communication, bridge, uh, respect, blend, organize, share, relate to. That's what belonging is really about. And we have to make sure that while we are valuing our students in the classroom, you know, this is a mantra that our university needs to hold dear and near to because it becomes a campus community of value. Uh, and note I said uh, campus of value, community, community, I'm sorry, and not family. Uh, because we all know that family is described on very many levels for different people. And I like to use the word community because I feel that with using the term community, it, it has a different value for those who are part of our institution. Now I'm going to transition into really relevance and practice and really how does DEIB uh, is how is it relevance and practice? So I've given you some standard definitions, so to speak. Now I want to share with you how me as a faculty, uh, I'm, and I'm basing a lot of this off of what I have done in my classrooms over the years in um, infusing diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. I had a student one day, an African-American young woman says she didn't see color. And I was trying to really get her to understand we all see color, we do, and it's okay to see color. Uh, but she said, well, I don't see color, I judge people based on the content of their character. And I said, well, how can you do that when you don't know the individual? And she said, well, I just do it that way because it's a lot easier. I said, well, if you're going to do that, then you're not uh, really seeing the person for who they are. You are really looking at it, looking at that person objectively as opposed to subjectively. And subjectively is how I look at the people I meet because I wanna know the things I can't see about you. And oftentimes we as faculty, we have a tendency of looking at our students subjectively. So I don't know, think about, uh, I mean, objectively, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, objectively. So these are the things that I do, so semi tidbits, but well, I'll, I'll suspend and just move on. So with diversity, you know, I want to make sure that, first of all, our curriculum is rigorous, it's relevant, and really is, I want to make sure that I'm challenging my students. And when I'm challenging my students, I really want them to think about the concepts of the real world, 
be open-minded, think about how complex this can be, what would it look like, and how would they experience it? If they are uncomfortable, then I always ask, ask yourself, why are you uncomfortable when we're talking about diversity? And as I have here in my, um, my screen, you know, the benefits of diversity in education, especially here in higher ed, stretch far and wide affecting students' academic and social experience, as well as having a direct impact on their future. We're in a cesspool, folks. <laughs> this is the best time to learn about uh, DEIB and have those experiences. I like to call it as your stage of life, as for students, that is. This is when you get to, oh, can I do that over again so that I can learn more? And this is that opportunity to do this. Um, so the positive effect, really, it enable our students to work with people from many, uh, from different races, ethnicity, uh, orientation, you know, cultural backgrounds, to really challenge their views. Because I, I have this thought, and, and I've shared this so many times, uh, I don't know if I shared it with any of you on this call, but you have two sets of tapes. You have your birth to 18 tapes where your parents were your first teachers. And I I'm not, understand I'm not trying to say parents are bad because they're not. They could only teach you what they know. Then you have the second set of tapes for those of you a little older. And I would say right about from 19 to about 27, you're here on a campus and you're learning about different things. But faculty is also trying to learn about you. And so these new tapes are now in conflict with the old tapes because what I learned about race and ethnicity, sexual orientation, et cetera, is conflicting with my new tapes because I'm learning about individuals that, oh my gosh, subjectively and objectively, new information, okay? Leads to greater awareness. And for those of you who are a little older, past 30 and on, now you get to uh, actually put these new tapes, well, your third set of tapes, I should say, into action when you're trying to understand and accept what those differs, differing beliefs, values, and customs. You know, so I asked the question, so why is diversity important in college? Well, I, I uh, honestly believe, and, and after doing some research, uh, studies show that diversity in education, particularly on college campus, improved the intellect, intellectual engagement, self-motivation, citizenship, and cultural engagement, and academic skills for critical thinking, problem solving for our students. So that's why it's important that when we're um, presenting our content to our students that we really challenge our students. And sometimes our students do not like to be challenged, as you know, because they think they know everything, which honestly, they don't. That's okay, Noah. I know you know some things. <laughs> but I want to expand your knowledge. And that's what we, we as faculty, you know, should do with, uh, and especially in our curriculum content, you know, we have to be able to cognitively, cognitively challenge our students, even have these open dialogues, which is the one thing I love about Wildcat Dialogue, because it really does challenge our students to think differently, but also think beyond themselves. Um, so the question is, as faculty, how comfortable are you in discussing diversity? within your curriculum using multiple perspectives. Uh, equity. Uh, equity can have a lot of different definitions, as I stated earlier, depending on the context. But at its core, the concepts involve giving everyone a situation, the specific tools that they need to be successful. Um, first of all, you know, this is not a job of one single person. When we're talking about equity, it takes all of us in the classroom. Uh, it requires full participation, not just with students, but faculty as well. Uh, we want to be able to respect everyone's voice when we're talking about equity. And we want students to uh, be empowered, but yet we also want them to be knowledgeable in how to respect those voices. Because I, I can tell you now that, <clears throat> excuse me, when and we, um, when we talk about equity versus equality, 
versus judgment, you know, we argue over the merits of what those images could possibly look like. But what is missing is a deeper conversation about what equity means in the classroom. So I want you to think about that. So what does equity mean in the classroom? And how are um, various curricular initiatives contribute to the transformation of our students? I also want us to listen. I always tell people we have to learn to listen and we have to listen to learn. And oftentimes we're so caught up in our own thoughts that we're not listening to what is uh, being shared or even hearing someone else's voice. You know, our classroom works in progress when we inevitably bring our different social identities and social locations when we're talking about the learning process. So in order to promote equity in the classroom, you know, there are very, very few specific and uh, significant standards educators seem to aim at, uh, aim at. And the last one is, is inclusion. So what does inclusion environment look like for faculty? And I like the way James Banks talks about the curriculum should be one that establish, um, I mean, challenges established structure and content uh, such that several perspectives are explored. And sometimes as faculty, that, that can be a little challenging. It, is cha it challenged me when I was a faculty also, uh, when I was looking to how can I bring those multiple perspectives in and whose voices would we wanna hear about? Uh, faculty are responsible for creating inclusive or responsive learning environments. Uh, first of all, we have to, um, students should be involved in all aspects of the learning in those classroom activities, uh, taking time to figure out, you know, what students need so they feel included in the curriculum and also supported in the classroom. Uh, I had one student say to me, Dr. Stoney, I'm tired of learning about dead white men. And I said to him, bring me information you feel that will expand upon your knowledge and how do we share it? And then I want you to work with me side by side and teach it. And he thought I threw him under the bus, but I really wanted, you know, as future teachers, because I worked in our teacher education program, I wanted to give them the opportunity to be the lead discussant because in uh, public school, teachers have everything under the sun of types of students they will work with. So uh, he did a great job and he was a little nervous about it, but he did a great job. And I was really proud in the fact that how he brought in the multiple perspectives in the, our area of physical education and dealing with dance, um, different types of exercises, movements that came from different uh, countries, different uh, origins, et cetera. And then we also have to consider, you know, what kind of resources and services are available we, uh, we will share with our students. And, you know, first of all, get to know your students. Get to know who they are. I know this is easier said than done. We have a lot of students we see, but, you know, get to know who they are, where they're from, uh, their do's and don'ts, whatever happens. You like Starbucks or Redina? Redina's. I always usually ask that question, which is your favorite coffee? Um, you know, just places. Get to know who they are. I, yes, is it, it is a lot of work. But again, you want to learn about your students subjectively and uh, work with students to maximize their participation in learning and understanding your content as faculty and instructors. Belonging. Um, with belonging, you know, research indicates a sense of belonging is positively associated with academic success and motivation. I have to agree with that. Because uh, when students feel that they, are be uh, they belong, uh, they see themselves not only as valued uh, in the classroom, but also they have higher self-belief in themselves to be successful in your courses. Um, empirical studies have showed that uh, linked perception of school and campus belonging is linked to positive psychological outcomes, whether those are of course, uh, emotional outcomes, mental health. And we know how, you know, we deal with mental health every day with our students. So that to, I'm sorry, hold on for a second. 
that mental health, the self-worth, and social acceptance are very important to our students. Belonging affects students' well-being. As I was talking about the mental health and belonging influences prospective student choices of a university. Um, I know for a fact that when I was a freshman in college, I needed to know exactly what was going on and if I was going to feel comfortable enough to be in that, be uh, to attend that institution. And I really liked the way that my first week of classes, I had faculty members who actually showed me what it was like to belong at University of Texas at El Paso, which is a, which is a Hispanic serving institution. And I have to honestly say, I thoroughly enjoyed that, my time there as a student as well as a graduate student. So that sense of belonging is very important to a student's choice. I um, spoke to a young man who said, I chose K-State uh, because they were very accepting, he said, and I'm gay. And he said, and I just love the way K-State made me feel accepted. And that speaks volumes to me because when you look at the two masks here, we don't want our students to feel like they are alone or lost on our campuses, but we want them to be received genuinely. Uh, we want them to feel welcome and connected to the classrooms, but we also want as faculty to have them connect to us. So now I'm gonna go into teaching for change. So when we're talking about teaching for change, um, so how does one examine your course diversity? You know, what is the tone of your syllabus? Is it inviting? Uh, you know, the curriculum experience, you know, is the core content, I'm sorry, the core component in higher education and what we do. So setting that tone is very important when, as educators. So, you know, our students look at our syllabi and wonder, oh, well, what will I get out of this? Where do I see myself involved in this particular course or I have to take it as a requirement so I may as well get through it but uh, C is good enough for me you know how inviting is your syllabi how many of you investigate question and reflect on your own biases from a place of non-judgment I have to honestly say uh yeah I've had to really sit down and look at my own syllabi and uh I ask myself okay where my where does exactly is my biases lie when I'm working with students. So if I find that I, my biases are very judgmental, I really look back and figure out, okay, if I was a student in this setting, how would I want to learn from this faculty member? And I have to be actually brave. We have to be brave enough to examine our own biases and what that could look like. And we also have to be humble enough uh, to recognize that we have so much to learn as faculty. You know, um, I have to say that in uh, my example, I want to use here is approach to topics in different situations. And as I explained to you, uh, I mean, I shared with you about the young lady saying she didn't see color. Uh, I have to, um, actually my colleague who's a white gentleman, we always have our dialogue on his perspective as a white, um, privileged male and my perspective as a privileged black woman in education. And uh, we talk about those situations so that our students can share and understand what we're talking about uh, so that they can see what those multiple perspectives look like. Learning and discomfort, both faculty and students, uh, we need to build our capacity to learn in and through discomfort and, and basically in this state uh, we can actually be become more open to each other uh, we can listen uh, differently or we can share new ideas uh, and we can actually challenge one another uh, and then inclusive teaching um, refers to pedagogy that strive to serve you know hearing diverse perspectives can enrich student learning by exposing everyone to stimulating discussion. I'm all about the stimulating discussions. Um, two examples I wanna share with you, uh, incorporating diverse uh, perspective, you know, 
structure your classroom conversations to where they're engaging and respectful uh, and equitable uh, for all. Uh, in this diverse perspective, you also want to, you know, try to use smaller groups to encourage non-competitive ways of learning and also encourage um, cross-cultural communication, because sometimes we probably don't think about that cross-culture communication. Uh, we want to anticipate as faculty, you know, sensitive uh, issues that could possibly come up and then someone trying to defend uh, whatever the topic is without listening to learn. And then inclusive classroom climate, we want to make sure that, you know, we use multiple uh, examples. We want to make sure we encourage participation for all our students. We want to make sure that we're personally connecting with students and students connecting with each other. And then also we want to model inclusive language. Uh, and one thing I have learned over the past is that inclusive language is often uh, eliminated, uh, particularly when we're talking about pronouns. And that's something I, I, I have to say I've been humble by on many levels understand pronouns but that's part of inclusivity my summation so why is teaching for change important on a college campus study shows that diversity in education particularly on a college campus improves intellectual engagement self-motivation citizenship i'm not going to read all that because i'm not going to insult your levels of intelligence but interacting with diverse peers outside the classroom setting directly benefits students making them better scholars, thinkers, and citizens. So I say to you, my last thing, how do you infuse all of this DEIB into your curriculum? Well, for starters, K-State Unite. We have K-State Unite that will occur next week on October 12th. And there's the um, website. Uh, I, I really want you all to particularly pay close attention to our plenary speakers. We have Minnie Jean uh, Brown Trickery, who is one of the uh, Little Rock Nines. Um, excited to hear about her story. And then we have Dr. Kate Stevens, uh, who is presenting on a complex yet essential inter interconnectivity of community building, vulnerability, and mental health. I believe these two uh, individuals will serve greatly in uh, their plenaries and sharing about their lives. And then also we have um, uh, sessions. Uh, I, I didn't name them at all because I figured you'll go on the website and see this, but uh, I want you also to remember that we have KSU 9365, where we uh, recognize all our programs and events that are happening on campus. So bring all this together, teaching for a change, is we have it here, right here on our campus. Here's the opportunity to integrate what we have through KS KS Unite 365, but also talk with your peers as well. Feel free to contact me. I'm here to um, you know, share with you what we can and, and what I can rather, and just to have conversation when we're talking about how do we begin to change when we're teaching how do we include DEIB? But more importantly, how do we as faculty to begin to keep students involved with our content based on our syllabus? So that's it. Questions? Thank you, Dr. Stoney. That was, that was wonderful. Um, one of the questions that, that we often get is, what do we do tomorrow? So a lot of this kind of happens like in the overarching course design, but what can we do tomorrow to do better? And I'll, the first answer is we're going to announce about KS Unite tomorrow. But what's the first thing we can kind of do tomorrow to start doing this stuff in our classes if we haven't been doing this as well as we can? I would say, as I stated on one of the slides, I would begin with my syllabus and see how my syllabus is really inviting what information well, I teach about, I don't care if it's math, if it's geography, if it's English, check that out and see how you are approaching what you are teaching to our students. And then also, as I also stated on one of those slides, is it judgmental? Am I being judgmental in my teaching? And 
look, I, I had to, like I said, I had to humble myself by looking at how judgmental I was with my syllabi. And so I actually asked students, so what would you like to learn that I don't teach about? And I, I have to say, I greatly respect them sharing that. Well, sometimes, you know, we don't talk enough about X, Y, Z. So I try to make sure that X, Y, Z is are covered so that they feel that they are part of what we have, uh, what they want to learn, but also preparing them for the next level of whether citizenship for the uh, global world or for um, them as future teachers in the classroom. So a, a resistance that we sometimes get in these conversations is people will say, but my class isn't the class to do this. So I could see that for a social science or humanity or an art class or something like that, but my class in physics or math or whatever, and I'm not pointing at those disciplines in particular, but right. my right. class isn't the place to do those kinds of things. I can't ask my students what they wanna learn because I already have a set curriculum. So what can our response be to kind of help some of colleagues in those areas do some of this? Well, for those colleagues in those areas, again, I go back, to, I, I wanna say, and why not? Uh, even if it's math, I'm not picking on mathematics, okay? Uh, you're gonna tell me the only people in mathematics are dead white men? No, it didn't originate there. You know, Abalonia days. I mean, we have to reach back uh, into the history of your content area to share with students, you know, the, um, to share with students where it all started. And yes, I know I've had a lot of faculty members say to me, that has nothing to do with me, but it has everything because your students leave your class and come to a class like mine and begin to ask these questions. And I always say, well, you go back to your original start and ask that teacher because that is their discipline. That's what I would say to those who think that this doesn't include them. Uh, I do want to take a moment that there's some people in the chat who have offered some other thoughts on this as well. Um, Adam said, uh, also changing our mind frame about DEIB. It's not extra work, uh, but instead it's our responsibility because learning about ourselves and others is needed everywhere. I think that's very, very nicely stated. Tim said, thank you, and also gives uh, information about an event uh, for K-State graduate Lori Healy talking about bringing hope home uh, at the Obama Presidential Center next Friday. And uh, Alyssa also says, guiding your students to take classes and even minor in American ethnic studies might be a way to kind of increase their appreciation for diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to kind of make sure that we understood that in the chat, there's some great ideas going in there too. Um, but other questions for Dr. Stone? Uh, here's a question. In my classes at K-State, I often have few students of color. What recommendations do you have for navigating conversation about race and ethnicity so that these students have a voice but also do not feel pressured to represent a community. How can I do that as an instructor? And how can I guide all of my students to do the same? Well, my quest, first question to you is how comfortable are you talking about race, gender, et cetera? Uh, secondly, yes, oftentimes students of color do feel like they have to represent, but on one of the slides I mentioned about small groups, put them in small groups and ask the students. So, how do we navigate and talking about the conversation of race and ethnicity? What are your experiences? Because one thing I've learned about here at K-State, a lot of our K-State students uh, have graduated from small classes or, small, or from small towns, or even those from larger towns. I don't know how this can happen, but they really don't interact with uh, students of color. But yet they're here on this campus and they still behave the same way as though they're in high school. So I would suggest you find your comfort first in talking about, like I said, race, uh, but don't make it a pressure situation by, if the, say for example, if a student say, well, in my neighborhood, we had no black people and all of a sudden, or a person of color, and all of a sudden the whole class turned to the one student of color. As a faculty, I would say, well, wait a minute, let's not ask so-and-so to represent Let's unpack that and let's talk about it in depth and what do you think uh, the experiences are for you if you lived in a neighborhood like that or 
what do you think the experiences would look like if you didn't what you don't live in a neighborhood like that what are those feelings so you know you got to ask your students to unpack what they think and what they're feeling and um i don't what well, i don't think that it the conversation would be centered on embarrassing or pressuring a student of color but it actually will alleviate some of that uh pressure because he or she does not have to explain to their peers why they have to represent uh, their their community or the groups that they are members of does that make sense melissa we can talk further about this one-on-one -on -one. yeah it's not extra work thank you tim i'm trying to catch up uh uh here uh jessica almost says and melissa what about talking about white as a race and culture aspect that apply uh whiteness is typically seen as a norm and not as a race or culture so um and and we have to get students to understand as well as adults to understand that white is a race it's uh, not necessarily the norm it's um, unfortunately in america it appears to be the not appears it is the norm but we also have to recognize that the other identities whether it's uh, you know gender identity, sexual orientation, socioeconomics, those are norms too. But we also have to be inclusive when we're talking about what those norms look like throughout all racial divides. Uh, the danger of a single story. Yes, that is a great video to watch um, because uh, that single story. It, it, I don't know if you all had the chance to, to look at it, but I've watched it so many times, I think I have it memorized in my head, but uh, I'm not gonna go into, into details on that one, but I would strongly suggest that everyone watch um, that video. Uh, anything else? Oh, please, uh, Melissa, never be uh, nervous to ask because when we don't ask, we don't learn, okay? So feel free, shoot me an email if you feel you need to ask questions that you are nervous about. But think about it this way. When we are nervous to ask, we no longer talk. It's the same for our students. And that's why I say as faculty and instructors, we have to humble ourselves first. We have to check ourselves first. We have to be comfortable. It, you know, it's the saying goes, uh, it's okay to be, you have to be uncomfortable to get comfortable or vice versa. And I have to honestly say that I have been in some, a lot of uncomfortable situations, but I also had to ask myself, why am I uncomfortable and how do I manage to navigate through this conversation? Always safe, you're always safe with me. Um, any other questions? There's uh, someone shared the link um, for uh, Adichie's uh, The Danger of a uh, Single Story. Yeah, okay. I'm trying to go through this. Well, I hope you all have uh, gained some knowledge. Uh, if you want a copy of my PowerPoint, because I have references on here of other um, resources you can use um, that uh, talks a lot about DEIB in the classroom, your syllabi, you as faculty. I will share that with Ashley and Dr. Saucier so that um, you all can continue learning. But anytime, feel free, send me an email and uh, I'll answer your questions accordingly. Thank you so much, Teacher Learning Center, for this opportunity. I have enjoyed it. I love talking to teachers. Uh, I don't know why. But I just love talking to our faculty. I'm sorry, I refer to everyone as teachers. Thank you, Noah. Uh, thank you, students. Thank you all for this opportunity. And I look forward to a further dialogue. Thank you so much, Dr. Stoney. That was a wonderful event. I'd like to remind those in the audience, we have post-event surveys that we'll make available to you so you can give your thoughts about this. If you're pursuing a teaching um, certificate, uh, a professional development certificate, this counted as a need-to-know event. 
um, in that. So you're getting a little closer to that. And we'll also remind you that we do this every Wednesday at noon. And next week we have our series. Uh, we'll continue with how do I engage in the scholarship of teaching and learning, a discussion with teaching scholars and their experiences. This will be a panel moderated by Jason Bergtold and will include Kim Williams, Lisa Rubin, and Andy Barkley. So I'm very excited to see them next week, but I was very excited to see Dr. Stoney today. So Dr. Stoney, one more time, thank you so much for sharing with us this afternoon. Sure, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.